see him since. Ah, sir, sir, that cannot be. But were I not the better part, made mercy, I should not seek an absent argument of my revenge. Thou present, but look to it. Find out thy brother wheresoever he is. Seek him with candle, bring him dead or living within this twelve month. But turn thou no more to seek a living in our territory. Thy lands and all things that thou dost call thine worth seizure do we seize into our hands, until thou canst quit thee by thy brother's mouth of what we think we can see. Oh, that your highness knew my heart in this. I never loved my brother in my life. More villain thou. Now push him out of doors. And let my officers of such a nature they can accept from this house Hang there my purse, in witness of my love. And thou, thrice crowned queen of night, survey with thy chaste eye from thy pale sphere above my huntress name, that my full life doth sway. Oh, Rosalind! These trees shall be my books, and in their barks my thoughts are carried. That every eye which in this forest looks shall see thy virtue witnessed everywhere. Run, run, Orlando, carve on every tree the fair, the chaste, and unexpressive she. Sweat. 
And he's not the grease of a mutt as wholesome as the sweat of a man. Shallow, shallow. <laughs> a better instance, I say, come. Say, so our hands are hard, your lips will fill them the sooner, shallow again. A more sounder instance, I say, come. And they're often tarred over with the surgery of our sheep. <coughs> Would you have us kiss tar? The courtier's hands are perfumed with cinnamon. Most shallow. <laughs> The worm's meat in respect of a good piece of flesh indeed. Now learn of the wise and her pain. Civet is of a baser birth than tar. It's the very uncleanly flux of a cat. Mend the instant, shepherd. <laughs> you have too courtly a wit for me, I'll rest. <laughs>
But didst thou hear without wondering how thy name should be hand and cast upon these trees? I was seven of the nine days out of the wonder before you came. For look you here what I found on a palm tree. I was never so berimed since Pythagoras' time that I was an Irish rat, which I hardly <coughs> remember. Truth, I was looking for a fool when I found you. It's 
drowned in the brook. Look, Patina, and you shall see him. There, I shall see my own figure, which I take to be either a fool or a cipher. I'll tarry no longer with you. Farewell. Good senior love. I'm glad of your departure, you. <laughs> Good Monsieur Melancholy. I will speak to him like a saucy lackey. And under that habit, play the maid with him. Simply having a beard is a younger brother's revenue. Then your host should 
be unguarded, your bonnet unbanded, your sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied, and everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. But you are no such man. You are rather quite device in your accoutrements, as loving yourself and seeming the lover of any other. Fair youth! I would I could make thee believe I love.
cannot be understood. Now, a man's good wit, seconded with a fall, with child understanding. It strikes a man more dead than a great reckoning in a little room. Truly, I would the gods had made thee poetical. I do not know what poetical is. <laughs> is it honest in deed and word? Is it a true thing? No. <laughs> Given to poetry, yeah. on what they swear in poetry, may be said as lovers they do fail. Well, do you wish then the gods have made me poetical? I do, truly. <laughs> but thou swearest to me thou art on it. Now, if thou wert a poet, I might have some hopes thou didst fail. Would you not have me honest? Uh, no. <laughs> now, unless thou wert hard favoured, but to have honesty coupled to where money is sourced to sugar. Well, I am not fair, therefore I pray the gods make me honest. Surely! <laughs> and to cast away honesty upon a foul slut when I put good meat into an unclean dish. I am not a slut! <laughs> well, thank the gods I am foul. <laughs>
begs to consider that tears do not become a man. But have I not cause to weep? It's good cause if one can desire, therefore. His very hair is of the dissembling color. There's nothing proud of his is it? Faith, his hair is of a good color. Oh, an excellent color. Your chestnut was ever your only color. And his kissing is as full of sanctity as the touch of holy bread. He, he bought a pair of cast lips to die <coughs> Cheek of cream that can entail my spirits to your worship. You fool. 
are like foggy south, puffing with wind and rain. You're a thousand times a properer man than she a woman. To such fools as you makes the world full of ill-favored children. <laughs> but mistress, know yourself. <coughs> Down on your knees and thank heaven fasting for a good man's love. For I must tell you, friendly in your ear, <coughs> sell when you can, you're not for all markets. <laughs> Thank you. 
comes to every modern sense, you're worse than drunkards. Why, it is good to be sad and say nothing. Why, it is good to be a post. I have neither the scholar's melancholy, which is emulation, nor the lawyer's, which is politic, but it is the melancholy of my own, compounded of many symbols, extracted from many objects, and indeed, the sundry contemplation of my travels, in which, by often rumination, wraps me in a most humorous sad. A travel? By my faith, you have great reason to be sad. I fear you've sold your own lands to see other men's. Then to have seen much and to have nothing is to have rich eyes and poor hands. Yes, I have gained my experience. And your experience makes you sad. Well, I'd rather have a fool to make me merry than experience to make me sad and to travel for it. Good day and happiness, dear Rosalind. They got by you when you talk in blank verse. <laughs> <laughs> Farewell, Monsieur Traveller. Look, you lisp and wear strange suits. Disable all the benefits of your own country. Be out of love with your nativity. And almost chide God for making you that countenance you are. But I shall scarce think you've swam in a gondola. How now, Orlando? Where have you been all this while? You are lover, and you've served me such a knowledge you'd never come in my sight more. My fair Rosalind, I come within an hour of my promise. Break an hour's promise in love. He that will break a minute into a thousand parts, and break the part of a thousandth part of a minute in the affairs of love. It may be said of him that Cupid hath clapped him with a shoulder, but I'll warrant him heart hold. Pardon me, dear Rosalind. He's so tardy, come no more at my sight, and as lief be wooed of a snail. Of a snail? I am a snail. Although he comes slowly, he carries his house on his head. A better jointure, I think, than you make a woman. Besides, he brings his destiny with him. What's that? Why, horns. <laughs> Which such as you are fain to be beholden to your wife's horn. And he comes armed in his fortune and prevents the slander of his wife. Virtue is no horn maker, and my Rosalind is virtuous. And I am your Rosalind. I hope 
grosser. Why then can one desire too much of a good thing? <laughs> come, sister. Come. You shall be the priest and marry us. Give me your hand, Orlando. What do you say to me? I pray you. Marius. I cannot say the word. <laughs> you, you must begin. Will you, Orlando?
son, my affection hath an unknown bottom like the Bay of Portugal, or rather bottomless, that as fast as you pour affection in it runs out. No, that same wicked bastard of Venus that was begot of thought, conceived of spleen and born of madness, that blind, rascally boy that abuses everyone's eyes because his own are out. Let him be judged how deep I am in love. I'll tell you, Adrian, I cannot be out of the sight of all that. <coughs> I'll go find a shadow and sigh till you come. And I'll see. Love to thee, 
little knows this love in me. And by him, seal up thy mind, whether that thy youth and kind will the faithful offer take of me and all that I can make. Or else by him my love deny, and then I'll study how to die. Call you this chiding? Alas, poor shepherd. What, do you pity him? No, he deserves no pity. But thou love such a woman, what to make thee an instrument and play false strains upon thee, not to be endured. Well, go your ways, well, for I see love has made thee a tame snake. And say this to her, that if she loves me, I charge her to love thee. If she will not, I will never have her unless thou entreat for her. You be a true lover hence, and not a word.
might excuse his broken promise and to give this lad. He died in his blood under that shepherd youth that he in sport doth call him.
may enjoy your company. You have my consent. Let your wedding be tomorrow. Little will I invite the Duke and all his contented followers. But go even prepared, I yet. For look here, here comes my Rosalind. God save you, brother. And you, fair sister. <laughs> oh, my poor Orlando. How it grieves me to see thee wear thy heart in a scarf. It is my art.
to love you. If this be so, why blame you me to love you? <laughs> Who do you speak to? Why blame you me to love you? To her that is not here, nor doth not hear. I pray you no more of this, tis like the howling of Irish wolves against the moon. I will help you if I can. I would love you if I could. Tomorrow meet me all together. I will marry you if ever I marry woman, and I shall be married tomorrow. <laughs> I will satisfy you if ever I satisfy man, and you shall be married tomorrow. I will content you of what pleases you contents you, and you shall be married tomorrow. As you love Rosalind meat, as you love Phoebe meat, and as I love no woman, I'll meet. So fare you well. I've left you command. Yes, 
better amongst the rest of the country copulatives. To swear and to foreswear of going as married vines and blood grapes. A poor virgin, sir. An ill favoured thing, sir, but my own. A poor human of mine, sir, to take that that no man else will. Rich honesty dwells like a miser in a poor house, as your pearl in your foul oyster. By my faith, he's very swift and sententious. According to the fool's body, sir, and as a dulcet disease. But the seventh <laughs> cause. How did you find the quarrel on the seventh cause? Upon a lie, seven times removed. <laughs> now bear your body, you see. As <laughs> that. Now I did dislike the cut of a certain courtier's beard. Now he sent me word. If I said his beard was not well cut, he was in the mind he was. This is called the retort courteous. <laughs> if I sent him word again it was not well cut, he would send me word. He cut it to please himself. This is called the quick modest. If again it was not well cut, he disabled my judgment. And this is called the reply church. If again it was not well cut, he would answer, I spake not true. Ah, uh, this is called the reproof of valiant. If again it was no well cut, he would say I lie. This is called the counter check quarrelsome. So to lie circumstantial and lie direct. How oft did you say his beard was not well cut? Well, I just don't know further than the lie circumstantial, sir. No, he durst not give me the lie direct, so we make his swords and bargains. Can you nominate in order now the degrees of the lie? That's a weak quarrel in please. By the book. As you have books for good manners, I'll name you the three. The first to be taught carriages, the second the quit moist, the third to be fly church, the fourth to be proof value, the fifth the counter check wobblesome, the sixth the lie with circumstance, the seventh the lie direct. Now all the things you may avoid, but the lie direct. And you may avoid that too. <laughs> but here. He appoint you when seven justices could not take up the quarrel. But when the parties themselves were met, one of them thought that of an inn. As, uh, what well, each you said so, then I said so. <laughs> they shook hands and swore brothers. Your if is your only peacemaker.
dear niece, welcome thou art to me. Even daughter, welcome in no less degree. I do not eat my word, now thou art mine. Thy faith, my fancy, to thee doth confine. Let me have audience for a word or two. I am the second son of old Sir Roland that bring these tidings to this fair assembly. Duke Frederick, hearing how that every day men of great worth resorted to this forest, addressed a mighty power which were on foot in his own conduct, purposely to take his brother here and put him to the sword. And to the skirts of this wild wood he came, where meeting with an old religious man, after some question with him, was converted, both from his enterprise and from the world, his crown bequeathing to his banished brother, and all their lands restored to them again that were with him exiled. This to be true, I do engage my life. Thou offerest fairly to thy brother's wedding. To one his land was held, and to the other a land itself at large, a potent duke. First in this forest let us do these ends that here were well begun and well begun. And after every of this happy number that has endured shrewd days and night with us, shall share the good of our return of fortune according to the measure of his state. <coughs> Meantime, forget this new fallen dignity and fall into our rustic reverie. Play music, and you brides and bridegrooms all, to the measures heaped in joy, to the measure of all. Sir, by your patience, I heard you rightly the Duke has put on a religious life and thrown it to neglect the pompous court. He has. To him will I. Out of these convertites there is much matter to be heard and learned. <laughs> you, to your former honor, I decree, your patience and your virtue is well deserved. You, to a love that your true faith doth mend. You, to your land and love, Great ally, you to a long and well deserved bed, <laughs> and you to wrangling for thy loving voyage is but for two months little. So, to your pleasures, I am for other than for dancing measures. Stay, Jerry, stay! You see no past thy mind. What you would have, I'll stay to know. Proceed, proceed, we'll begin these rites. As we do trust, they'll end in true delight. Okay. It is not the fashion to see the lady the epilogue, but it is no more unhandsome than to see the law of the prologue. If it be true that a good wine needs no bush, tis true that a good play needs no epilogue. Yet, the good wine they do use good bushes, and good plays prove the better by the help of good epilogues. What a case am I in then, that am neither a good epilogue, nor cannot insinuate with you in the behalf of a good play. I'm not furnished like a beggar, therefore to beg will not become me. My way is to conjure you, and I'll begin with the women. I charge you, O women, for the love you bear to men, to like as much of this play as please you. And I charge you, O men, for the love you bear to women, as I perceive by your simpering none of you hates them, <laughs> that between you and the women the play may please. If I were a woman, I would kiss as many of you as had beards that pleased me, complexions that liked me, and breaths that I defied not. <laughs> I'm sure as many as have good beards or good faces or sweet breaths will for my kind offer, when I make curtsy, bid me farewell. <laughs> 